welcome to the English Hour on ANN Satellite Television. Our guest today is Ambassador Mark Hamley. He was founder and director of the Media Outreach Center established under the authority of the US Congress prior to the Second Gulf War. During a 35-year diplomatic career, Ambassador Hamley served in Lebanon and Qatar. He also served as Consul General in Alexandria and Jeddah. And indeed, he served in a total of 11 cities and nine countries. He was U.S. Chief Negotiator at Kyoto in the climate change talks and U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Committee on Sustainable Development. He is a trustee of the Next Century Foundation and a board member of America's Middle East Policy Council. And so I think the more that we as, as Americans, while we don't have to get involved militarily, there are things we can do diplomatically to the humanitarian needs of the Syrian people who've been forced out, out, of, the, out of the country have been given uh, appropriate uh, support. And as I'm a former diplomat, and diplomats have to be, glass always half full, not half empty. Ambassador Hamley, it's a great joy to have you with us. We've been friends for many years, and I'm really, really pleased that you are joined us as a guest on ANN today. There is so much to talk about in the Middle East. We look at the, the chaos, actually, that is prevailing right across the Middle East from, well, from Lebanon, down through Syria, down through Iraq. Um, let's start with Iraq, only because you and I have traveled there together mm. very recently. Uh, it was the time of the elections. We were there in Baghdad, in Kirkuk, and in Kabbalah and Najaf. A very precious time. A very encouraging. If there's one big plus in the aftermath of that enormous sacrifice in terms of blood that was made to establish the new Iraq, it is presumably, I would say, Iraq's democracy, wouldn't you? Well, thanks very much for your, your kind welcome, uh, William. It's good to be here with you and your, with your many uh, oh, viewers you. on ANN. Um, I think Iraq is indeed a, a surprise when one visits it. When, you, when one reads about any country in the Middle East, certainly the Western media, all you hear about are the awful events which are taking place on, on, on a nearly daily basis. But in Iraq, I think it was extraordinary to see these elections unfold in an environment where uh, there was concern that terrorism would strike. Indeed, it did strike on the day of the, the first day of the elections. They had two days for the elections. One was um, on the 28th of, of April for the military voters, some 850,000 troops went out to vote. And then two days later on the 30th when the general public went out. And I think that everyone was concerned that, uh, that there would be an eruption. So there would be a lot of difficulties in, in having a fair, transparent vote. But I think uh, as we saw, uh, the case was quite the contrary. It was a very, uh, it was almost a carnival atmosphere in many places in Baghdad where we visited throughout the, the, that vast city. Uh, people bring their children out. Uh, there was no security issues at all in Baghdad, unlike the uh, 2010 when we also monitored those elections. So I think it's quite correct that there is a new, the new sense of of well-being in Iraq, despite some of the serious problems that still exist in that country. Yeah, they have a confidence. They, I mean, they organized those elections themselves. The U.S. was not involved in terms of security. The U.N. was not involved in terms of organizational. No matters and it they seem sustainable I mean I think Iraq is here to say and what was really exciting I thought was all that enthusiasm on the streets those posters you couldn't move two inches without seeing yet another poster no. for yet another candidate it well I think in, in Kirkuk which is certainly an area of, 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 of great tension where there are severe se severe security problems there are bombs go off almost every week in, in Kirkuk as we ourselves evidenced um, we're up there there were two attacks, deadly attacks on polling stations as we were going around observing mm -hmm. what was taking place there. Uh, that being said, um, there are a thousand candidates for 12 seats in Parliament in Kirkuk. And you see, as you indicate, all these signs up about people for various lists, various individuals who are out to vote with their pictures. It was also extraordinary. One would think that'd be a big problem. Then the election, that uh, the, what would do the paper and all the, the frames of these photographs, they're all gone on election day because all recycled. All the pictures came down, and all, yes. the, all the frames yes. were carted off to be recycled. The city was clean on yeah, the 1st of May. Yeah, yeah remarkable. Uh, but having said that, the elections are done and dusted, and Iraq moves on. But it problem, its problems remain. Uh, you have a 
kind of, just like Syria in a way, and, and Bahrain to a point, and Lebanon to a point, we are seeing a geopolitical struggle between these two great religions, I would say. Now, is that fair? Between, between Shiite Islam and Sunni Islam uh, taking place right across the Middle East, and Iraq is one of the frontline nations. Is that, is that fair, or is that a wrong way of looking at it? I think there's certainly no doubt that there is a, uh, a clash of civilizations in some ways taking place in the Middle East, being played out by, by really uh, the two great, great centers, one Shiite and one, one Sunni. And many of the countries are victims of this. Uh, Lebanon is always a victim of this for many years. Syria is the current uh, focal point of a lot of struggle. And Iraq also has been a, been a great uh, contentious area since the fall of Saddam. But I think in Iraq, um, there you have a Kurdish element as well, which, which plays, mm -hmm. comes to play. The Kurds have been deprived of any sense of nationality uh, throughout their history. And, and suddenly, since 2003 especially, they've been able to, to develop under the terms of the Constitution, which is approved by the Iraqi people. They have a, a, a semi-autonomous state up in the north, which is thriving. Uh, one visits it, and one is astounded by the prosperity, by the tranquility, despite the fact there are a few uh, incidents over these elections in our bill, generally it's a very, very safe place and one which is prospering. Um, there, is, there are issues with the central government over the oil. This is a big issue which, which must be solved by the Iraqi government. The Iraqi people are going to move ahead. But I think in terms of the real clash of, of, of Sunni Shia in, in Iraq, although there's the big issue in Ambar, which, um, which is, is one which will have to be, be carefully brought into, into account, I think, nonetheless, in, in Iraq itself, I think there's a lot of goodwill which is expressed on both sides, and I hope that will be able to. to so you mentioned Anbar, for example, which is really hmm. the hub of one of the key issues, one of the key problems in Iraq. And whose fault? Is it Iraq's fault, or is it the fault of the neighboring nations? I mean, well, I think that there's no doubt that uh, the 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 problems at Anbar most recently have been created by outsiders coming in in, par in, in terms of these pro-Al-Qaeda groups. The, the ISIS group, the Islamic State of, of uh, Iraq and, and the Levant, or Sham, whatever you want to call it, ISIS, or the uh, Daesh, however you want to call it, uh, Al-Nusra front as well. The way they've been playing in, into, um, into the Iraqi conscience and, and, and stirring up of uh, the episodes of, of conflict between the Sunni and the Shia, I think it's something which certainly has exacerbated the situation. No doubt there has to be efforts on the part of the central government, amongst the Iraqis themselves, to come to, to a, uh, a better political settlement of some of the deep-seated grievances which have followed since 2003. I hope with the elections having been uh, concluded, that will be able to take place. I think the, uh, the main issue is getting these outside forces, which are there in considerable number, they must be indeed removed from the, from the mm. situation. But without so a spirit of forgiveness, I mean, part of the, mm. I, I often despair when you see things like the, what do they call it, the truth, uh, truth justice and, and yeah. yeah, justice and truth or whatever it is, yeah. committee uh, in, in Baghdad um, saying that this person or that person cannot stand because of their political history and they may have had some vague relationship with the Ba'ath Party in the past. This is seen as, as an anti-Sunni measure. Um, we need more of a spirit of forgiveness in Iraq, don't we, if, we if, if this country is going to come to some reconciliation between these groups? I think it's been now, uh, what, uh, 11 years since the fall of Saddam. I think uh, as many countries have gone through these sorts of great traumas, be it Rwanda, South Africa, whatever, there's got to be a way in which people can put that aside and move ahead as, as one, u one unified community. And I would agree with you that uh, there has to be a better truth and reconciliation uh, 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 effort on the part of the government to try to eliminate these, these uh, grievances which Sunni Savage, I think in some ways are very legitimate. There's no doubt there's discrimination in terms of employment, so in terms of electoral uh, policies, and I think that's something which is an important step which the government of Iraq must take if they're going to be able to move ahead as one unified mm -hmm. country. And you feel they will. I mean, they, these, these fears of Iraq breaking up. There is a risk that the, the Kurdish area may go its own way wouldn't you say or no? Well, I don't really think. I think again, there, the Kurds. Um, I think Jalal Talabani did a great service to Iraq by taking his, taking his leadership, being president of Iraq, uh, being a leading Kurd, one of the two great Kurdish leaders, present time, Lal Masood Barzani. I think that certainly brought the Kurds into a broader framework of Iraq. No doubt, there are Kurds who would like to see an independent country. 
Um, one day that may indeed uh, take place, but I think for the moment, um, Kurds are more interested in making sure they have their access to their resources so they continue to develop. I think that it's a, a process where Iraq as a country uh, would like to move ahead as, as a unit. But again, there's other issues uh, in Anbar. There have been Sudanese who claim that because there are oil resources on their lands as well, which could be developed, they'd like to see access to those, which an autonomous framework might give them. There's great reluctance, I think, to move, move that direction too, uh, uh, too forthrightly, despite the fact the Constitution does permit that. Mm, interesting. Let's, um, I mean, maybe we'll come back to Iraq, but at the, at the moment, let's just move on from another country. Well, and it's wrong to, to roll these countries out as if they, the situations were linked. They're not necessarily, but, um, but another country that we have both just visited recently is Bahrain. Mm. Um, and Bahrain, again, has uh, what people perceive as a, as a kind of sectarian confrontation. Obviously, it's not a war in the same way as it is in Anbar province in Iraq, but but there is there are tensions um do you see a brighter future for bahrain well i think bahrain as well is a country which can have a very a very bright future i think certainly our, our visit uh, in uh, in may certainly gave us a lot of hope that there can be a resolution to some of these long-standing differences which have, have arisen in in bahrain i think bahrain's different in that you do have an outside power which is stirring things up iran definitely is trying to use uh, Bahrain as its card against Saudi Arabia in its overall effort to try to uh, give itself a broader role in the Middle East generally. Mm -hmm. And I think for that reason, until you have a rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran on some form, I don't really think you're going to see a formal resolution of the Bahrain situation. I think there's, there is a lot to be said for, you know, the arms, which arms caches which have been, been discovered periodically coming emanating from Iran, the, uh, the support which Iranians periodically give out Bringing, bringing Bahrain back into their, into their fold once more. I think these are, are deliberate efforts on the part of Iran to keep the uh, situation somewhat in tumult. And until those can be pacified and removed, uh, I think there's going to always be some, some difficulties in resolving the problems of Bahrain. But I'm confident that Bahrain is some of the kindest people, most hospitable people in the Middle East, an area which is known for kind, hospitable people. And I think that uh, over time those issues can indeed be resolved. It takes mm -hmm. goodwill on the part of the government. The government certainly has indicated through its, through its efforts that it, it wants to try and meet the opposition at least halfway. The opposition, I think, has to try and make its efforts known to meet the government halfway as well. Mm. That, yes, because that national dialogue they've had has been sort of stalled occasionally. No. Um, but it hasn't but broken down. It hasn't broken down. It's uh, been stalled. But when you have leading members of the Crown Prince taking the lead on the government side, I think that's certainly a very positive a positive uh, a step forward. Mm, interesting. And, you th and meanwhile, in the background, you mentioned Iran and Saudi Arabia. Of course, there are moves of a kind. Raf Sanjani has been meeting Saudis. Um, possible. I, uh, olive branches being held out in both directions. There's a change in policy, maybe from Saudi Arabia, or at least a slight change in policy. Uh, do you see this as a way forward? Things are moving forward? or? Oh, I think certainly it's always promising when countries are talking. The Saudis have always indicated they are, always have a channel open to the Iranians, and, and countries always have very quiet private back channels to discuss specific issues, problems when they come up. But I think in Saudi Arabia's instance, it's a question of they want to have a relationship with, with Iran where Iran ceases to be what they view as being a, a, an existential threat to the existence of Saudi Arabia, indeed of Sunni Islam. Um, this is th their great confrontation, go back several hundred years. Um, so I think that certainly any overtures to Raf Sunjani are important, but he's only one figure in the government. Um, as you know, the Iranian government has various factions yes, in it. Yes, many. So it, I think it, it depends really um, on having one with Rouhani and with other elements of the... I think Rouhani government. would like that. I mean, he, he clearly would. And, and as would the Revolutionary Guard and elements of that kind who have their own access if, um, if these channels can be built up. But at the same time, we've, I mean, we, we've got a, a tragic situation if there is no dialogue of this kind. And here, the USA is missing a trick because I, it bothers me that the US is holding nuclear negotiations with Iran 
or at least the P5, if you like. But the U.S. is in the lead because it's having its yeah. own secret negotiations one-to-one -one in Oman, or has been. So the U.S. has done the whole deal, and then the P5 are just strung along, I think. Whatever the case, <laughs> at the end of the day, um, they're not linking this to Syria. Uh, so they let Iran off the hook on Syria um, and on issues in regard to Syria, whereas Iran could be a great force for peace in Syria. And they're dealing with this nuclear issue like it's a separate parcel all by itself. Surely that's a mistake on U.S. policy. Well, I think the nuclear issue is sufficiently important that that takes up all the time. Again, the people that are negotiating that are experts in that field. They don't have, um, you, you know, you have different, different discussions with different individuals. Yeah, but how can you discuss the nuclear issue and leave out Syria? I mean, it's... Well, I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue at the moment is to get that nuclear issue resolved. Well, that's what the Iranians want, but then we have to well, quid pro quo. I, we want I to get would, something out of them. I would concur, and I think this is the great fear that we will sell out with Iran, and we will give them a, a nuclear result which will not, in fact, resolve their, our concerns about their ability to, to make uh, nuclear weapons in an instant. Mm. Um, that's the real concern that most people that watch this issue have, uh, that are critical of the administration's approach. But that said, I think, certainly I agree with you, Syria, Iran has a key role to play in terms of any resolve, a resolution of the Syrian problem. Indeed, it has a role to play in the resolution of the Yemen problems, all sorts of areas where it has been messing around. Well, we mentioned Bahrain mm. as well. They have a, a lot that they have to, have to deal with. The United States always indicated they want uh, Iran, before we'll have any, any normalization for our relationships, they must end their support for we regard as terrorist actions. And they certainly have done many of those in Saudi Arabia itself. Uh, they've stirred things up in Iran. In, in Yemen and certainly in Syria too. But therefore it's particularly childish, I mean almost infantile, to, to keep Iran out of the Geneva peace talks. Um, because, I, well I'm assuming that if we ever get back to the Geneva peace talks, but, but the, the Iran is a key player, isn't it? Well they this just in the United States which tried to keep them out. I believe Saudi Arabia, other countries as well. Have yeah, also but the US is in the lead. Well, true. But I think in terms of keeping uh, Syria out of the Geneva peace talks. Iran out of the Geneva peace talks. Iran out of the, out of the yeah. uh, Geneva peace talks. Many people say the Geneva peace talks had no legs anyways. So it didn't really matter if they were involved in the... Um, in but the it, was, it was something. Yeah. It, was a, it, was a, it was striking a blow for peace. However inadequate, however... Mm. In, you know, yeah. I mean, there, there was at least some attempt yeah. at something. I think that where the error was is that the United Nations invited Iran on the supposition that was approved by the U.S. and, and the Russians. Which it should have been. Which it should, I agree it should have been. But then to withdraw that invitation meant yeah. that Iran completely stayed off without any support at all for that particular mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. And that certainly, I think, contributed to the result we saw in Geneva, which was not positive at all. Well, it was not positive. It wasn't negative. The real catastrophe of Geneva is that it is no longer ongoing because Russia and America are distracted by the Ukraine, I mean, which, which has put everything on hold, no? Yes, and that's not the United States' fault, that's the well, right. Russians' <laughs> fault. But, <laughs> but <laughs> we're we're blaming yeah, Russia, but yeah. nonetheless, yeah. Yeah. nonetheless. Well, it was said it, when that occurred, that would indeed have an impact on the uh, Syrian issues, and other issues with the Russians as well. Um, thus far, it hasn't hurt our, the relationship with Russia is so vast, we have all sorts of issues. There's arms negotiations between the U.S. and the, and the, and the Russians on uh, reducing conventional arms, as well as our missile forces. That's still ongoing, um, but that will probably be stopped too if this doesn't resolve itself in Ukraine. We also have other issues regarding our own space program goes via, uh, thanks to the Russian uh, space program, that may be put on hold too. We have our astronauts isolated up in, in space. We're oh not dears. careful. There's all sorts of issues which are playing out here, which are, are part of the problem. Put so much concern about what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, to be honest, uh, if Russia had taken, you can understand the Russia's aspiration to take the Crimea because historically it was part of Russia and so forth. If Russia well, before then that, it was not Russian. Yeah, it was well, all right, but if, if yeah. Russia had left it there, mm. then probably the U.S. would have shrugged and, and well. it's the ongoing threat to the rest of Ukraine, isn't it, really, that is causing tension between Russia and America? Well, at the moment, the issue is uh, what's Putin's agenda. I mean, yeah. 
Uh, obviously, we've, we've confirmed that he has been stirring things up in eastern Ukraine. Um, there's almost a total war broken out in eastern Ukraine because of that, so it's an issue which, which has to find a resolution, hopefully in a peaceful manner rather than by force of arms, which appears to be the direction. Well, it is a great tragedy. Um, I'm not blaming the U.S. particularly or Russia particularly, but just the nature of international diplomacy is that this distraction can put everything on hold with regard to Syria. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just such a shame, isn't it, that, 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 that something happens somewhere else and we all have to rush over there and ignore the progress that we might have been well, making. Well, in some ways, they might be used as an excuse for not taking action on Syria. Um, that, that's the problem I see with, you know, we say because the Russians are engaged in Ukraine, we can't deal with them on, on Syria. I don't know the extent we've asked them to do anything on Syria. I would doubt, frankly, we have because we're focused on Ukraine. I think that's incorrect. I think we should indeed try to re-engage re on a political level, try to resolve the problem of Syria. The only solution to that problem is a political diplomatic solution. It cannot be resolved through force of arms. Yes, perhaps that's the problem, is that international nations are too male-focused. They can only deal with one issue at a time. They need a bit of the feminine where you can multitask. Exactly, and, yeah. exactly. But yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It, it, is, it is really tragic. Um, you were, um, I mean, we, again, we maybe will come back to the Syria issue, uh, but, but you were ambassador in Lebanon for a number of years. Lebanon uh, is, well, it's, it's surviving. It's kind of, it goes on, um, limps along, um, quite happily in a way. Uh, yeah, you, are you content with the way Lebanon is moving, the way Lebanon is developing, or is it... Personally, no. Personally, I'm distressed by Lebanon. I've been distressed by Lebanon ever since 1975, when the 76, when the the first civil war started. Lebanon, at one point, was always pointed out as being the the Switzerland of the Middle East, mm -hmm. a place where everybody could meet, uh, and everybody could play and have a good time, where uh, an intercommunal uh, community w worked out a political arrangement which seemed to be satisfactory. There were quasi democratic elections held uh, on a base until 1972. I think it was the last last one before these, these most latest ones after the Taif Accords. But I think the problem in Lebanon is the, the population has been so completely changed, the demographics have changed so much over the past uh, several decades. During the Civil War, the Maronite community largely, huge numbers of it left the country, which diminished their overall numbers in Lebanon. The Sunnis as well, many of them left. The, the Shiites have grown in number considerably. They are by far the largest of the groups in Lebanon now, which gives them extra clout in terms of, of, of governance. Uh, this last election uh, they had, which brought Hezbollah basically into a controlling position in the, in the government, was, was an extraordinary development. But in spite of that, Lebanon did continu continue economically. Um, under uh, uh, Rafiq Hariri, um, he did develop the Solidaire project, which redeveloped Beirut. This came at great cost because it's sort of eminent domain taking property away from landowners in order to Built, rebuild downtown Beirut, which was completely destroyed during the Civil War. When I was in, in, in Beirut in 1993-1995, it was still a very, very uh, sad place to visit. These old buildings mm -hmm. used to see in the 1960s and 70s were, were gone, just rubble. Uh, but that has all been redeveloped now into a way which may not, may not satisfy those of us who remember the old Beirut, but it's, it's, it's development in terms of people can walk the streets safely and have a, have a good cup of coffee down the Corniche. Um, but that is, it's, as one may say, the problem now in Lebanon, you have over a million Syrian refugees in a country which only has four million people to begin with. Yeah. yeah and so Lebane that. Lebanese have been very gracious hosts to many of them. But these, of course, there are confrontations which come out of this. There's a lot of, of concern. Lebanon has had a history of problems with its refugees. Uh, the Palestinian refugees were an unwelcome uh, addition to the, to the Syrian, to the Lebanese environment starting after the Six-Day War in 1967, and they, of course, later became key to the start of the Civil War themselves when Yasser Arafat moved his headquarters to Beirut, precipitated the Israeli invasion in 1980. I mean, all sorts of issues which, which refugees have been resented by Lebanese. For, and of course, they had no rights to work in the country. They were sort of stateless people, and a lot of mm -hmm. radical movements have developed from those camps because of that. Um, mm -hmm. So now when you have a million refugees who who do not want to be there, but are forced to come into uh, Lebanon, find work and place to live in dreadful circumstances. 
um, it's a real, real strain on society and one which uh, the national community should do a lot more to address. And that's where I think our, where we could be doing things we're not, regardless of what's happening in Ukraine. Um, we should, I think, do a lot more in terms of our overall effort to mobilize resources to help all Syrian refugees, be in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, or wherever. Yeah, we keep saying this on ANN. I mean, you're, we have had meetings in Kuwait and so forth that have committed billions, it seems, uh, to, to the relief of r Syrian refugees, mm. and nothing to speak of. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the token amount of money yeah. that is actually spent. So these ridiculous promises made yeah. by the international community are actually shameful. Yeah, I absolutely. Mean, I agree. Yeah. I, mean, I think certain in terms of U.S. policy, I would strongly agree we should not be arming the rebels in Syria. I don't think that does anything but create problems. Um, but I do think what we could do and stay within our, our, you know, our, our commitments to a, to a hu humane society is to mobilize our very considerable military efforts in, in getting the aid process organized. Um, we can do that outside Lebanon, very outside uh, Syria very easily, I think. It takes a lot of resource on our part. We could make sure, though, that assistance, A, comes into, the, into those centers, mm -hmm. is distributed proper to people, work with the UN and other organizations, but I mean, really put an effort into doing it rather than allowing just aid agencies to use minimal funds to provide minimal services. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have this, well, I suppose it's a, it's slightly distressing. We're not looking at a very positive Middle East. Um, one of the other areas, if we're cherry picking various countries, one that was very close to your heart was Egypt. Ah, Muslim Mahbubah. And uh, it's, where is it going? I mean, it, uh, the tensions there, uh, obviously we're, we're moving into a new era. Um, a positive one? Are we, are we, we we've seen this kind of a coup d'etat against the Muslim Brotherhood government uh, and then proceeded to elections. Um, is this, well, is it, is it good? Is, the, is Egypt full of promise and hope or are we going to see despair there too? Well, again, anyone who tries to look at the Middle East with a crystal ball always is, is an error. Um, who can predict, no one predicted the Arab Spring to begin with in, in 2011. Um, so no, no one predicted what happened in Tunisia in December of 2010. Um, so I would be very reluctant to, to make a, a broad judgment, except to say that I think Egypt has been here for 7,000 years, it will continue. Um, Egyptian people are wonderful people again, they're very generous of heart, but there's many of them. Uh, you know, when Egypt was, uh, to put into perspective, Egypt a country of 384,000 square miles, uh, of which only 15,000 square miles are arable. The delta going down, down the Nile River, 15,000. Mm -hmm. When Nasser took control in 1952, there were about 23 million Egyptians. When Sadat took control in 1971, there were about uh, uh, 55 million Egyptians. Mubarak took control about 62 million. Now there's over 90 million Egyptians, 90 million people. And those people still have to rely on the same resources available to them. They've developed their, their, their natural gas, and they've developed their oil resources considerably. The country under the last few years of the Mubarak regime was growing at a nice pace of five, six, seven percent a year. Um, but a lot of the, the jobs which are being created are not labor-intensive jobs. New economies don't focus on, on, uh, on wide-scale employment. So you had issues before the, the uh, January 25th revolution in Egypt uh, those started as protests at the Mahal Kubra, the huge textile factories. Workers' demands in those textile factories, which have been closed and had some serious labor disputes in the, in the Delta, in Mahal Kubra. And that's what first drove that 25th of uh, January uh, uh, dispute, which then it mushroomed, really? into, yeah. mushroomed into this other, this other phenomenon, which resulted in Mubarak's uh, forced withdrawal on February 11th of 2011. So Egypt is a country where the first consideration of the president has to be security. Second has to be the welfare of his people. And I, I give uh, Morsi, I think, made some very serious errors of judgment when he went into office by not focusing on either one of those. Uh, he intended focused on trying to make sure the Muslim Brotherhood would be there for the future uh, and in terms of changing judicial procedures so that he could move ahead and put the Muslim Brothers in a position where they would rule Egypt forever. The Jewish people caught on to that very quickly, a lot faster than the U.S. government did and other governments, frankly, and mobilized massive numbers of people into the streets on June 30th, 
which propelled then uh, General Sisi and the military to remove him from office uh, a few days later on, on July 5th. But uh, that said, I think um, you know Egypt has, has a problem in terms of, of its national security, not really towards uh, the east, towards the south, to Ethiopia. The damming of the Nile River would be disastrous for Egypt. The abrogation unilaterally by Ethiopia of the treaty which controls the water rights of Sudan and Egypt was done without any reference to any other country, just abrogated. This treaty was done in the 1950s. And that, of course, created great concern under the Egyptian government. And I think one of the reasons why Morsi was removed, Frank, was because his response to that was, well, we'll negotiate it and send off a, a flunky from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to deal with it, whereas uh, Sisi and others felt it had a much stronger response to Ethiopia on that issue. Um, so that's something, if, if that water's cut any degree at all, Egypt would be in deep, deep trouble. It's an existential issue for Egypt, it's something which the West kind of tends to ignore in dealing with the issues of Egypt. Mm, interesting, yes. Yes, you remind me, it's a tra it's, this is irrelevant really, but it's, is it the Digila that runs through Damascus? Yeah. And, yeah, and, you, and you go the there Tigris, now, yeah. and it is just, it's just a little ditch. Stream, yeah. Um, so sad, and that's Turkey's doing, yeah. of course. Euphrates as well. The dams yeah. which Turkey's built have again not been in consultation with the, with the down uh, uh, the downstream countries, and Turkey has thrived because of that. It has wonderful agriculture because the waters are being largely maintained up in, in, in the Anatolian plain, rather than down into Syria. This is one of the problems with Syria: the drought in Syria, combined with the lack of water coming in from from Turkey was yes. one of the reasons, one of these socioeconomic yes. reasons yes. which which created, I think, the issues which which yes, because you, you did have that drought exactly. and pe populations moved from northern exactly. Syria into the cities. Exactly, yeah, without jobs yes. and governments had to be responsible to the needs of their people and they're not. You d one way, if you have elections, you can change your government. If you don't, then you have other responses which are taken to the street. Mm. So mm. It's, a, it's a real... Water c is continued. It's always been said that water would be a key issue of conflict in the future. And let me poo poo that was not really the case. There's no history of that. I think, in fact, we're starting to see an era where that may indeed start to be a, be a serious, serious problem in a lot of countries. Because mm -hmm. population continues to increase and water is indeed a great shortage. Yes, yeah. One of the problems with, um, with Jordan is that the, this massive Syrian uh, camp, which has been developed in, in, uh, in, in Jordan, of uh, what, 300,000 people, huge thing, which is, again, imbalances the Jordanian population sure. greatly. The water demand is something which puts a great strain on Jordan's capacity to, to supply water to its own people. So these are issues which really we have to look at very carefully. And Yemen as well is another case. Yemen well, now, that's a, good, that's a country I did want to talk about. I love Yemen. Yes, you've, you've served there, served there for indeed. some years. You met your wife. Uh, I did, who yes. We both know, Patricia, uh, in Yemen. I mean, it's, uh, it's a country I don't know, but it's a country very close to your heart. And uh, they're about to have elections this year. And again, they're a kind of frontline nation with, with you know, Saudi and Iran having, having interests. Tell us a little about Yemen. Well, Yemen is fundamentally a tribal society. And the largest tribe, tribal confederation is that of the Hashid. Um, and the largest tribe, that is the Hashid tribe which has been led, for, led by uh, Sheikh Abdul Hussein al-Ahmar, who passed away a few years ago. But up, up till then was a real power broker in Yemen and uh, was head of parliament, it was his last position, but was someone who, um, who the Saudis counted on to keep Yemen uh, a friendly country, to keep uh, uh, elements which they feared might spill over into Saudi Arabia under control. But since he passed away, um, Abdul Saleh had some problems with him, with the people took over from him. They thought they might try to take over from his, his job. Um, so you had the Houthis, you have the Hashid problem, and then you had a problem down in South Yemen. Yemen, of course, uh, had a civil war in uh, 1990 after the fall of the, of the Eastern Bloc. South Yemen being a communist country, they had a, they've had a marriage of, of convenience. That then the well, South they invaded, no? No, no, not originally. It was a peaceful... Really? 1991, it was ah. fine. Then they had a, a falling out, and then they had, a, and they declared the independence again in 1993, 1994, and then there was a there was a military uh, okay. invasion by the okay. north, which was very bloody, uh, not sh not long lived, but crushed them into into uh, submission. into submission. But uh, one of the problems has been because mo most of the oil is down the southern part of the country. Um, 
this oil was not, no revenue was being spent in the southern part of the country. They were largely being used by Abdul Saleh to pay off patronage to, to his various tribal networks to keep himself in power for so many decades. And so the country did not benefit from that one natural resource, which is now in the process of, of ending. Um, always a, maybe another decade before it'll be completely gone. So that's one big issue facing Yemen. There's no other industry except this oil to begin with. Secondly, you have had uh, large numbers of Yemenis in the past remittances from overseas Yemenis working in the Gulf and in Saudi Arabia, paid a lot of money into the, into the coffers of the country. Um, first under the first Gulf War, when Yemen sided with uh, Saddam Hussein in the invasion of Kuwait, um, many million Yemenis were sent back to, to Saudi Arabia, and that, uh, to, to Yemen, and that created a huge social imbalance in the country. And more recently, the Saudis have, have uh, struck up a, um, uh, a new law to remove illegal immigrants, and some of those have been Yemenis as well who have been forced back, and although they've also made some arrangements to make sure more Yemenis can remain in the kingdom. So you have a huge number of people without jobs. You have a, a, an economy where coffee was a, a significant export up until the 1970s, um, but in you know, all this very beautiful terrorist economy, and you had got being a, 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 a somewhat of a, an amphetamine drug, which is, you know, which is chewed, it's a social uh, convenience in, in Yemen. Um, that was mm. used to be chewed for once, once a week, basically on Fridays after, after prayers, after a nice lunch. And now it started then to be every day, and now it's, it's, a, it's a become a really difficult societal problem in Yemen. It's not just with that. alcohol, I think, in the West. Well, it's, 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 it's a little worse than that, but it, because it, unfortunately it, it's become such a productive um, crop that the coffee has gotten marginalized and moved on to the good. It's now a, it's now moved into the terrorist economy as well, and got demands water, and Yemen has a shortage of water. Like many places in the world, the weather patterns have changed somewhat. They're no longer the, the twice annual um, uh, monsoons which come in, depositing mm -hmm. waters, which make that part of Arabia. Arabia Felix used to be called Happy Arabia, <laughs> uh, because yeah, it's very very you know, you have that. You look at a map. From, from, from space, you have a big orange desert, then you have this green spot down the, in the southwestern corner, which was Yemen. And that's not quite, it's still green, but not quite as green because there's a problem with water. To the extent that Sana'a, a city which is now two, three million people, when I was there it was only a couple hundred thousand people maximum, um, now maybe the first capital to be forced to move with the lack of water. You cannot bring water up from the Red Sea, because it's, it's 7,500 feet, about about 1,800 meters above sea level. Mm. And you can't pump that water up from a desal plant down in Hodeida up. Not, it's just not feasible to do that. Mm. So it's a real problem Yemen has. So the president, to sum up, president has problems, number one, in terms of yes, with the Houthis, with the Hashid, with, um, with southern uh, dissidents. They've now moved, they want to have a, uh, for this national charter, which they somehow were able to come to a conclusion a few months ago to bring together a national charter which will lay forward the process for new elections. The Southerners did not agree with that because they want to move towards separatism. And of course this, this fourth great threat which faces Yemen is the threat from Al-Qaeda. Um, this uh, occurred following the, uh, the great problems which Saudi Arabia had, the very successful elimination of that problem in Saudi Arabia, moved many of those key members down to Yemen. They formed something called Al-Qaeda, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, their leaders have been very effective proponents of of expanding their, their attacks abroad towards the U.S., towards Europe. A number of instances where they've uncovered you know, bomb site airplanes, the, the so-called shoe bomber that gets to take off all of our shoes, was dispatched from Yemen. Uh, the U.S. used this policy of drones to, uh, uh, to eliminate some of these leaders of this movement. Yeah, and very counterproductively, obviously. I mean, at least it would seem to me that this policy, which is the Obama policy, he, he's been doing this, he's been doing this, it's a policy of assassination. Uh, it, we've seen it with the Israelis, they assassinated Palestinians. Now America has become the big international assassin. It's okay when it works, you strike the right guy, but so much collateral damage is done in Pakistan, in Yemen. I mean, it's, it's terrible policy, surely. I think certainly in Yemen, it certainly has been shown to be very counterproductive. Um, I think there's no doubt that re removing two of the key leaders which they've done it is good. I find that helped us a lot in terms of our war against, uh, against terrorism, as we like to, to phrase it. But I agree that the collateral damage in a tribal society has been disastrous. When you kill an innocent person in a tribe,
you have to give recompense. You don't give them sufficient recompense, they join to get revenge in other ways. So they have indeed increased the problem there, not reduced it. Mm -hmm. So there should be a different effort taken. Uh, and the Yemeni government is sufficiently weak that I'm afraid they don't really stand up to U.S. efforts to try to uh, basically bully them into accepting this policy. But I think it's something which certainly should have to be addressed in the future if we're going to mm. get anywhere on this. So this policy of using drones, there is a basic human rights issue, isn't there, surely? I mean, I, I know we're, we've been traveling out from country to country in the Middle East, but just to deal with this subject for a moment. We preach to the Middle East about human rights, and we do it again and again and again. Uh, and yet America uses drones uh, where you, we, uh, we, for goodness sake, I carry an American passport as well as a British one. I'm an Anglo-American. My mother is American, and my father has American roots. We are assassinating people uh, without trial in the Middle East and in Pakistan. Um, we're arresting people and putting them, or have been, Gu the Guantanamo still exists. Obama's great promise uh, was that this would be abolished. Um, we preach human rights to countries like Bahrain or to countries like Iran with some justification. We pick and choose because we don't care so much about China, one of the worst abusers of human rights on the face of the earth. I care. And well, no, but we ignore that. I'm sorry. We ignore, we pick and choose. We're picky uh, about who we criticize, who we don't criticize. We run like sheep to China to beg them for, for money or trade or whatever. We don't care about their human rights abuses. We might meanwhile abuse human rights on a massive scale and preach to countries in the Middle East about their behavior. I mean, surely we really need to clean up our act. And our oh, I would, is. yeah, I think there's no doubt we have to clean up our act. But that doesn't, uh, when you look at the drone pro, the drones aren't just arbitrarily used, oh, there's some people that's go attack them. They're very carefully, allegedly very carefully picked out and they're attacking somebody has to get permission from a committee. That person has to be on a list of someone who has in fact declared war against the United States. This is war we have against these groups. They've, they've created problems in the U.S., they've killed U.S. citizens. We go after them. Amr al-Aliki was an unusual person. He was, he was a U.S. citizen. That was extraordinary. After U.S. citizen that way was, you know, raised, raised a lot of constitutional issues in the U.S., which has been ratified by the courts now, but initially created a real problem how you go out and kill an American citizen without a fair trial. But nonetheless, because of his, his record of encouraging terrorism and supporting it and applauding it, he was eliminated. The difficulty with the drone program is that you pick out all these individuals, you go after them under false information, and you hit out a family, innocent people. And that has been, that the collateral damage that has created is not only in terms of the lost lives, in terms of, of the relations which the central government has with these tribes gets diminished. And the government has to have support from these tribes in order to bring together the national framework, makes national charter work. And that I think we have to be more conscious of in terms of carrying out this policy. But there's a real problem with Al-Qaeda based in the Arabian Peninsula, more so than any other group which exists, even the one in Syria. This is a problem in Syria as well. That may indeed develop the same sort of issue where they're transferring their, their efforts, not just locally putting them off in Europe and the U.S. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I you mean, know, Guanta Guantanamo is closing down. They're getting rid of the, these people. In fact, no new people are going in there. Uh, the president's under, he, it's, indeed, his first instruction was to close it down. The Congress said, you can't do it. Now, you know, we're constrained in our, in our process. We wanted to move those prisoners to the United States, said no, we have to leave them in Guantanamo, didn't want them in the U.S. Uh, I think that's wrong. We did have our first trial of a couple of these people in the U.S. Um, they were convicted, and uh, so be it. The remaining people in, in Guantanamo are either being s sent back to their home countries, but in many cases you can't send them back to their home countries because they would not be given a fair trial. So mm -hmm. I think the problem is they've been there without due process for the past 10 years, many of them. That's not, that's not a proper way to conduct it. Mm. Interesting. Uh, we're talking about all these situations. There's, um, there's one other country that you and I both have visited. Um, it seems like a, a long list of tragedies, really, but, but it was Libya. Um, mm. We went together at the time of the civil war to Libya. Uh, I remember traveling in with you over land to Benghazi. It was quite an arduous trip. The one big plus was to get to swim in the Mid Mediterranean, but <laughs> <laughs> you like your swimming. Yeah, but, um, 
but yes, it was an art, long, arduous trip to Benghazi. Um, and then there was hope around that, that there would be a better future for Libya. Libya now, where is it? It's, it's a mess after this civil war. Mm. Huh? Again, I think there, there has been a, uh, one, the euphoria which we evidenced in, in Benghazi despite the fact that Qaddafi was just a few miles away, his forces uh, could indeed have come into, into Benghazi at any time if Misrata had fallen. Mm -hmm. But uh, the euphoria of the people having their first sense of freedom after 40 years w was, was really infectious. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember going through the streets and, and celebrating with them and some of these, these, uh, these rallies and things. What I think our error was by, by endorsing a UN plan, which we stretched to the maximum to eliminate mm -hmm. Qaddafi from, yes. from office, I think two problems were too many countries got in and through aid to different groups without any consideration where these groups were represented. Some of those were mm. radical Islamists who had a completely different agenda sort of than the United States and the West had, uh, I think the United Nations had. And then secondly, once Gaddafi was out of office, we withdrew. Mm. We didn't follow up by using this resolution to get a UN process there to put control, get control of the militias, their weapons, to move them into, into society, to make sure they get into the armies to allow them to establish a civil administration which would be responsible for the transitional process. Um, and I think that's a real, real problem. Another problem that has the same problem which exists in Iraq, this, this uh, truth and reconciliation if issue. Anyone in any position with, uh, with Gaddafi's uh, uh, government over 40 years can no longer participate in the governments. So Abu Jalil, for example, withdrew, mm -hmm. one of the wiser people in this whole process. Um, so I think there's some real errors we, we've done in Libya, and I don't know how they're going to, going to be able to repair them. We do have people now, some, a small contingent of U.S. forces who are trying to train the Libyan army. Um, and, you know, maybe over time things can, uh, can resolve themselves. They had difficulty in terms of organizing their next elections. Uh, we don't know how those will turn out. Um, but I, I would hope they'll be as, as, if they can be as good elections as they've had in Iraq, they'll do well. But I, I'm afraid they probably won't be quite as smooth. Do you know the other thing um, I do want to ask you? You're unique in, I mean, not unique amongst Americans, but you're unique amongst my friends um, in so much as you are concerned and deeply concerned about the future of your country. Um, I'm an Anglo-American. I don't find myself deeply and profoundly concerned about the future of Britain or America. I guess those of us who have lived in the UK for a, a number of years or have been brought up here are less nationalistic in our outcome, perhaps in our perspective. Perhaps that's it. I don't know what it is, but, but you are deeply concerned about the future of your country. Why? What, what, is your, what, what is your vision for the future of America in the world? Well, it's not, it's not so much my vision. I think my concerns in the US are that uh, Politically, we become is very, very um, divided. Uh, we no longer have the bipartisanship, which, which since World War II has driven our foreign policy. Uh, it's very much divided between our red states, Republican states, and blue states, Democratic states. We don't have purple. We don't have states where everybody's talking amongst themselves as, as a broad community. There is a, a very much of a, uh, of a, you know, the president has a good idea because the presidents make that idea. Those who oppose him politically oppose that idea. There's no sense of finding common ground on broad issues, be they in terms of the economy, in terms of health care, in terms of national defense. Uh, there's no sense of developing a common ground where we move forward as a country. That I find to be a very disturbing development. It's not just on the uh, national level, it's on the local level too. Um, on the other hand, we do have, uh, you know, uh, in our, to our great advantage, we have a very open society. We have a society where we have a lot of very intelligent people who have new ideas all the time. Um, nothing's ever static in the United States. So as much as I, I have a lot of deep misgivings, personal misgivings, I turn the corner, I go to a high school graduation, and I'm very much willing to, you know, think young kids today are lazy. They don't get, you know, they they don't work as hard as me, and yet they are. There are people very concerned. They're not interested, perhaps, in going overseas and and raising a, a gun to fight uh, some some rebel off in, in Central Africa, but they are interested in going into their community to try to develop uh, health care for our own people who need health care mm -hmm. and to make, make amends their own society, which needs a lot of, a lot of correction as well. Which is maybe good. I mean, America will have, 
we used to have this term an isolationist policy, but it, it, it will be less concerned with adventures overseas, I think, in the coming well, years. Well, I, I think what we've learned, though, William, is that you know, we, no country is a country in on, on itself. The oceans used to defend us from, from foreign invasion, yeah, but I think that's no longer the case. Um, I think the, the interconnectivity we have between the economic factors and the clim climatic factors, everything as such, that I think every country should remain engaged. It's the way we get engaged. There's a lot of mistrust, which, which uh, is between some of the southern countries and those of the north. Um, you have the, the BRICS group, uh, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, and um, South so Africa, um, which frankly has a whole different view of the world. They want, they want to create a nice world for themselves, leave the West out of it, sort of penalize us for our development, um, it, it would seem. And that's not, that's not a positive development at all. Other hand, they're so different between those countries. I'm really worried about them because India is as different from China as China is from South Africa. So that's a very, very different sort of situation there. But I think we also have an issue where, uh, where even climate change is an issue. Um, we've cleaned up California immensely in terms of, of pollutants and things. We haven't adopted the Kyoto targets yet. We've almost we reached them by 1995. We've not done 1995 levels. We've done levels in terms of our our carbon efforts. We have to do more, and I think we have to do more as a, as a, as a world. Because while the West is making some strides, we just want to do a lot more. It's the, the new developing economies, China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, which have, you know, they've increased substantially because they're developing. And so we have to find a way in which we can uh, put us all on a level where everybody's equal pain, but for the common good. Yes, level playing field on environmental issues would be yeah. very good. Uh, but the future, therefore, is it, are we coming out of this saying the future is gloomy? The future is, well, there is a lot of promise. Perhaps the biggest plus, isn't it, is the interconnected world that you've just yeah. referred to, the internet generation. Yeah. There's less room for hatred of the other in a world in which, well, Facebook, Twitter, and so yeah. on makes children in Syria the friends of children in America. I mean, there, there, there is... It's a different world we're moving into, isn't it? No. That's, there's got to be a yeah, positive. Yeah, as a diplomat, I have to look at a glass always being half full. Mm. I mean, of nature, obviously, you wouldn't be a good diplomat, I don't think. You can't look at a half-empty glass. Um, there's a lot of problems. We've certainly discussed many of them today in the Middle East, which both of us love very much, very deeply. But I think it is indeed a different world out there. The way that you had the Tunisian revolt was a Facebook revolution. They taught Egypt the same thing. Egypt really wasn't a Facebook revolution, but it was something where everybody used the telephone and other ways to get their messages across to get these massive groups of people into the street. And I think that's certainly a positive, uh, positive development. Unfortunately, in Egypt, many of those kids that did that are currently uh, in jail or under <laughs> house arrest, so we have to hope they will be, be released and their creativity allowed yeah. to blossom yeah. forth once more. But that in, in due course, you can't keep a human being, good human beings down. In the Middle East, you see them in every country, in every country. No matter what its problems, its issues, you find in Gaza at that time, we visited that young man whose father had been a target of assassination a number of times. And he'd be very angry with us because it was American weapons, he said, used by the Israelis to kill his brother. And what do you want to talk about? Going to Cornell University to get an engineering degree to build, rebuild Gaza. Mm -hmm. That's the type of, type of, a, of a wonderful encounter you have which keeps us going to these places I yeah, think. Yeah but yeah, I remember that yeah. young boy wasn't he then killed in a drone strike himself? Indeed, he was. Um, yeah. I mean it makes yeah. you weep really yeah. but uh, it does indeed. But on the other hand you've chosen a country there that is it well Gaza I mean there's signal hope but that's the if we wanted to finish on a positive note there's the beginning of rapprochement between the um, however clumsy between the Palestinian West Bank mm. and Gaza um, there is, I know, hope of, of uh, solution to the Middle East. Peace process issue is pretty limited, but, but nonetheless, America has been, has been really honorable and principled. Kerry has, has done his darndest and has been trying hard. He has indeed. And, yeah. and, and, mm. and if there's just a little gem of hope about, it's, it's that Palestinian mm. issue. And... I, I don't know. I think I think maybe we are moving to a better tomorrow. Um, people are people are tired of war, and and they're looking for ways for. And peace. there's potential. That natural gas was not all sucked up with the Israelis. By the time they get to it, gives them a whole resource yes. they can use to use. Gaza should be a place like Singapore. Yes. yes. You know, it, it's a lot of potential there. People are so intelligent. 
You look at the traders of Lebanon, of Syria, of, of Palestine, I mean, of Iraq. The, this old rubric, you know, they, they used to write the books in Egypt, print them in Lebanon, and then read them in Iraq. It's something which has a certain amount of currency, which I like, because it shows that, that people, despite their countries and cultures, unless, you know, they're very, very intelligent. And they're very, they want to move forward mm -hmm. in terms of positive developments mm -hmm. for their people. No matter who you talk to, except for these extremists, who yeah. we've got to find to, to eliminate, you talk to these people in horrible circumstances, what do they want? The same things we all want. You want to have food for your family, you want to have security for your family, and you want to make sure that they have, have, have a good future, a better future than you have. And what, you know, that's wonderful things thing for any government to work for. I hope that's what the U.S. government continues to work for, the British government and other governments are united in that. You are, well, you're a great believer in, uh, I mean, uh, you've inspired me on this, and, but I should acknowledge it. You are a great believer in the, in the four freedoms. Absolutely. The basic Franklin Delano Roosevelt's four freedoms, very yeah, much so. Yeah, which are freedom from fear, freedom mm -hmm. from want, freedom of religion, and freedom of speech. And in many ways, if the well, the Arab mm. Spring is is has brought it's been a mixed blessing, but it but it has given people a sense of um, they they are valuing their personal mm. aspiration in mm. a way they were unable to do. Mm. I'm not saying they've got freedom of fear, mm. but they, they've got freedom of expression yeah, in yeah, a new way yeah. in the Middle East that we never quite yeah. had before. It's a matter of giving their human dignity, yeah. their basic human dignity, which is everybody's right. And I, I think in terms of these peace reconciliation movements that so many countries need, if you put in that context of giving everybody dignity, I think that's something that's going to advance the cause certainly as well. Bless you, Ambassador Hamley. It's really been a privilege to have you here on the English well, for ANN me. television. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Shokran.